Today we're going to be taking a look at Chris Rosser's Apex Frame Theory and testing it in the real world. If you don't know who Chris Rosser is, he's an engineer that has the freshest perspective that I've seen in years on how to improve flight performance through vibrational analysis. There are links in the description below and he's super interesting. But if you're a little bit new to this hobby, let's do a quick rundown of what these vibrations are. So on our quads that we're running, we have four motors, four props, and a rigid frame. And all of these items have a natural frequency or a resonant frequency. The motors are spinning and the props are vibrating and all that is gonna to multiply together with the frame or any other resonant frequency that is close to the vibration of any other component. This makes it very hard for the flight controller to actually read what on earth the gyroscope is doing on the flight controller. These gyros are extremely sensitive. They pick up things at very high speeds and very tiny movements. And just in order to get these things to fly, we have to push all that information through some filters to get some clean readings so that the flight control can actually respond to what's going on in the quad. Improving the vibrational setup or just dampening the vibrations is going to be, in my opinion, the number one way that we can improve our flight performance. Trying to do that vibrational dampening in the frame is exceedingly difficult <laughs> and um, not impossible, but exceedingly difficult. And so the primary improvements that we've seen in overall quads has been in, again, in my opinion, I'm not an engineer, I don't write the code, but I'm, I've been around it for a while. I think that the, the improvement in filtering is where we're seeing the majority of our improvement in flight performance. So this video is gonna be about how we can potentially design a frame in order to actually help the situation and not hurt the situation. Let's take a look at the Apex frame design. So the Apex frame arms have a very unique mounting mechanism. There are two bolts per arm, but the center set of bolts don't travel through the top plate. So the outer set of bolts travel through the bottom plate, through the arm, and through the top plate to bolt together very strong and tight. But the center set of bolts don't travel through the top plate. They travel through the bottom plate, through the arm, and then into a press nut that's inside the arm and not in the top plate. Now, in my opinion, the reason they did this is because they didn't want to have screws poking up through the bottom so that it can poke into your flight controller and potentially, or ESC, and potentially short something. I don't know if they did this on purpose, but Chris's theory is that because the arm screws, the center arm screws are not interacting with the top plate, this introduces some potential flexure or movement between the top of the arms and the top plate, which is where your flight controller is mounted. And so I've come up with a couple of designs to try and test this theory. This design that you're looking at is my lightweight five inch, it's actually 5.25 inch frame design that I've been working on very, very hard and I've gone through tons of revisions and I'm going to quickly go over the latest revision that I made which I thought was going to be the final revision uh, to try and manage the vibrations. So this one, yeah, this version was one of the one of the later revisions and it actually flew thankfully. I'm running a 2204 drivetrain on this frame which is about 40 grams and it's really hard to run that big of a motor with that much torque and power on such a tiny little frame with such skinny little arms. And so the issues that I've been trying to manage are vibrations in the motor that cause twisting and wobbling of the arms. But the whole goal here is to keep the frame very light. Now I went through a number of other design styles to try and see if I can help that but this was the most significant change that I made which may not seem significant, but actually is a very significant change. If you take a look at the bottom plate of this one on the left, which is the most recent one, and the one on the right, you'll notice that the mounting pattern of the arms is more square on the left. And the reason for this is because when I finally got the thing flying reasonably, I could do some analysis of the black box logs and I saw that most of the vibrations were coming in on the pitch axis and not on the roll axis. When I saw all the vibrations coming in on the pitch axis, what I did was I made the arm mount more square so as to balance the vibrations. I'm not going to be able to get rid of the vibrations, but if I could balance them and spread them across the pitch and the roll, the flight controller might have an easier time figuring out what to do with all those vibrations. The, the frame is still a wide X, so it still has more issues on the pitch axis, but 
it definitely improved significantly. Now let's test the apex theory. So the arm mechan mounting mechanism of this frame has a little pinwheel like puzzle together piece design in the middle where the arms kind of fit together and it's a very rigid tight lock. And in this particular type of a design, I personally think that might be an issue, but when I got this frame working so well, I was like, wow, Eureka, now I get to keep my five bolt mounting pattern and keep my weight really, really low. So then I devised this frame design. This frame design has a very, very similar mounting mechanism to the Apex frame design. It's got four bolts on the outside and it's got four bolts on the inside and the the press nuts that you see in there press into the actual arm end. There, there's no press nut in this arm end. And so the bolt travels up through the lower plate into the arm and through the press nut that's in the arm. And there's about a half millimeter circumference around each press nut where the arm can big wiggle and vibrate if it wants to. I also reduced the thickness of the frame to 1.5 millimeters because if you compare this to this one up here, the overall footprint of the main deck on the lower version is way, way, way bigger. So in order to keep the weight down, I had to move it down to 1.5 millimeters. So the main deck and the lower brace are now 1.5 millimeters, but I've made them way wider to try and shorten the arm. So I reduced the overall vibrations coming in from the arm because now the arm is just so much shorter, it's gonna vibrate at a higher frequency and cause less problems. In addition, you'll see that there are two other press nuts on top here. These two other press nuts on top are there specifically so I can test the apex theory because once I was done running this frame without these other two bolts in here that pass through the top plate and actually bolt the whole thing together, I could put this bolt in and test it again to see if fastening the center of the frame together is going to actually make it worse, which is what the theory is going to predict. Now, this particular design is what Chris was most interested in because when he did the vibration analysis on this one versus my previous design, he said that the overall vibrations out of this one with the apex frame mount design is very, very, very similar. Now, I didn't think that this one would work out and from my past experience, I guessed and it just straight up assumed off the top of my head that this one's actually not gonna work out because of the 1.5 millimeter body plates. And he did test it with 1.5 millimeter body plates. The frame is not flimsy at all, but it does flex quite a bit more than this one that has longer arms, same thickness of arms, just longer and it has two millimeter body plates and a two millimeter brace on the bottom. So let's take a look at the vibrational analysis and see what we get with this particular frame design. Before comparing the frames, let's take a look at the top left quadrant. Now this is my Tooth Fairy 2, I'm calling it, is my code name for now. And the 2 version is the second iteration where I changed the arm mount and everything, but it still has that little pinwheel puzzle together piece in the middle. This is without a capacitor, and I'm running 2204 motors on 3S on the iFlight H7 Beast, which has 55 amp ESCs and is 6S, I think it's even 8S capable. After putting just a 330 microfarad capacitor on the board, this is what the noise profile looked like. If you take a look at the top and the bottom on the left, there's, a, there's spikes, and on the lower chart, there are not as many spikes, and the overall spike amplitude or the height is lower on the lower left chart. That alone is a pretty big miracle in my eyes because I didn't expect this tiny little board that is so overpowered to need a capacitor still to have all this managed. Now let's take a look at the lower left and the lower right chart. What I did here was I lifted all the components off the TF2, the Tooth Fairy 2, and put it on the Tooth Fairy 3, which is the version that has the Apex style arm mount. When I lifted all that off and put that it, put it on the TF3 and flew it, same kind of style of flying, nothing special, you can clearly see that it actually got worse. So is that game over? Is it finished? Is the theory done? No, definitely not. There's a lot more to this. Now I put the bolts through the frame to secure the top plate to the bottom plate and I flew it again. That's the top right chart. As you can see, it actually improved. So I sent this to Chris and I'm like, eh, I don't know, maybe your theory doesn't really hold water, but I didn't expect this version of the frame to work out. I actually made a fourth version called Tooth Fairy 4, which I lost because it's in a tree now because I'm an idiot. 
But aside from that, I made a fourth version that has the same exact layout as my Tooth Fairy 2, except it has the arm mounting style from the Apex frame. Now this does have two millimeter plates. It does weigh about a gram and a half, two grams more than Tooth Fairy 2, and it does not have the same sort of vibrational output as the Tooth Fairy 3 does. However, to me, this is the closest analog to compare these two frames to one another because it's essentially the same frame with a different arm mounting mechanism. I still put those side bolts in so that I could test the frame center bolted together and not bolted together. When we take a look at this chart, the story changes quite a bit. If you look at the lower left and compare it against the lower right, which again is a direct transfer of the same components, same settings, everything is identical from the left to the right, you can clearly see that the overall amplitude, the spikes, particularly the highest spikes, have been reduced. But if you look at the overall spectrum, there are more vibrations across the range. So we've traded high amplitude for more vibrations across the spectrum. To me, the lower amplitude is more important than what's happening across the spectrum. So it's not really a high preference, but it seems like it has actually helped. And I would actually prefer the wider spectrum of lower amplitude vibrations because it's those sharp spikes that really kill you. Now, what I did next was I drove bolts through those other two holes to fasten the top plate to the bottom plate and flew it again. And that's the top right chart. And you can see that it absolutely got worse. And so what I ended up doing was I actually stopped production of this frame. They had already produced a couple hundred. And so I told them, wait, no, stop. And so what we're gonna do is that we're actually gonna get those couple hundred that had the previous design, which is really just as good. But because this is a marginal improvement, I'm gonna actually introduce this into the design and I'm gonna make the final frame design with this. So we're gonna have like a half batch of previous design and then the full batch and moving forward will be this improvement arguably now what did we actually learn from all this what we learned was well i'll tell you what my predictions were i thought the apex frame theory was not going to hold water i did not think it would work out i don't think it made any difference to me having the most rigid frame that pushes all the frequency ranges way way higher up in the frequency range such that it's out of the spectrum that we even care about that's the way I've been approaching this, this problem. You can never actually get rid of everything. It's all a trade-off. So I've constantly been adjusting things back and forth to try and push things higher up into the frequency range while trying to manage the vibrations in the lower range. And because everybody's putting different motors and props and everything on their quad, it's super duper hard to do this because it's, it's like the Microsoft problem. They're making one operating system for every computer out there, whereas Apple is making one operating system for one computer because they make that one computer. So DJI actually has a huge step up on this if they wanted to make an actual FPV quad, but we're working with a broad spectrum of components. There's a lot of other things to be said for this. Um, the shorter arms did not actually help, um, thankfully, which I'm very happy to see. And I don't even know if this Apex frame mounting style is gonna translate into other designs. I've actually worked really hard to build a very similar mechanism into my prototype five frame design. And compared to the Glide, the prototype five has about a 10, 11% improvement in vibration performance versus the Glide, which is what Chris told me, which is super cool, super fun to see. And his video on the Glide is gonna come out pretty soon. Just because a frame doesn't have perfect vibrational management doesn't mean that it's bad. It doesn't mean that it's not gonna fly. I mean, obviously you can strap four, four motors to freaking chopsticks and they're gonna fly fine, but it is interesting to look at. And if we can figure out ways to drastically improve the vibrations in our setup, in the actual frame, that's gonna be the best possible way to improve our flight performance. That's it, I've got, that's all I've got for now. I've spoken enough. Uh, I mean, this, we're gonna, I'm actually gonna be on uh, Bardwell's channel this weekend. All these planes flying overhead. And we have Bardwell's channel this weekend with Chris and um, Ryan Harrell. And holy crap, this plane is loud. Anyways, thanks for watching. Floss your teeth, brush too. Very important. Take care, bye.
As a bonus, if you made it this far, here is what the vibrational analysis looks like with crossbars on this frame. And what's super interesting about this is that the central point of the vibration is moving around. And so when I put those crossbars on the frame and flew it, it was drastically worse. And I got this video after I put those crossbars on. Ultra, ultra interesting. So crossbars don't always fix the issue. It's very important to try and identify what the actual issue is and then try to improve it by means that actually improve the issue, not by just strapping crap to the quad to try and get it to be performing better. Bye.